Uh, I'm Joe Starita. I'm a native of uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, where I was born and raised. I was educated at Lincoln Northeast High School and the University of Nebraska. I am a graduate of the College of Journalism, uh, where I have a, a, um, an undergraduate degree uh, from the College of Journalism, and I spent um, about 15 years working in New York and Miami, and um, uh, grew to really miss the uh, open sky and open plains and, um, and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of the elements actually that drove me away um, I began to miss and uh, so the good life beckoned and I returned in 1992 uh, I got a master's degree from the University of Nebraska College of Journalism and since then I've written several books and I was city editor of the Lincoln Journal Star the local newspaper for a couple of years and I've been teaching investigative reporting, depth reporting at the College of Journalism for the last eight years. Yes, I, I would be hard pressed to think of any uh, very many Nebraska writers in which uh, the sky, the land, the openness, the sheer power of, of the Great Plains landscape has not had an effect on them and, and I certainly include myself in that. Um, you you I don't believe you can really write about issues that have spun out of this fabric that we call the Northern Plains or the Great Plains or the Midwest without understanding the relationship between the people and the land because that relationship has existed from pioneer days uh, to the Homestead Act to, to this morning's newspaper in which there's a large article about uh, drawing down the uh, Ogallala Aquifer and what does it mean for farmers and of course predating all of this was the fact that many 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 native uh, uh, civilizations called this place home for hundreds and hundreds thousands of years before uh, Lewis and Clark ever got a glimpse of it so you can't write about this part of the country without understanding the relationship between the people and the land, whether that was the, the Ponca or the Lakota or the Eco Dusters or uh, the Pioneer families or the, the uh, people who struggled through the Depression or the, the modern farmer of today. It's, it's inextricably interwoven into the people, the culture uh, of this part of the country. And you have to understand that, I think, if you're going to write about uh, anything that has to do with uh, the Northern Great Plains. Some of the people who, who have influenced uh, my writing uh, are people who understood that if you get things right, and if you're writing about stories that are born and developed and nurtured in this part of the country, if you pay attention and do that right, the landscape becomes a central character in your book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Uh, and you can, you, you can look at Willa Cather for examples of that. You can look at Mari Sandos for examples of that. You can look at Ted Kuzer, more and more contemporary, for examples of that. Uh, and I don't believe really you can find many writers who, who come from Nebraska who, who have not been influenced by this landscape to the point where it's incorporated and adapted into the book. And uh, in my own specific case, the book that I just finished on, on the Ponca Chief Standing Bear, I spent dozens and dozens and dozens of hours pouring through uh, pouring through through uh, all kinds of ecological reports and uh, Bureau of Land Ca Claim reports and naturalist reports. So I became a mini expert on the Niobrara River and the Niobrara River Valley and its history, its ancient history, its, 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 its flow, uh, where the water came from, the lattice of tributaries that, that developed it. Because unless the reader understood the relationship of the Ponca to the Niobrara River and the Niobrara River Valley, they weren't going to buy into the rest of the story. So I had no story if I didn't understand the impact and the relationship between the Ponca people and their beloved homeland near where the, where the Niobrara pours into the Missouri. If you don't understand that, and if you don't develop that almost sacred landscape into a character, into one of the characters in this book, the reader's not going to understand why they would walk 600 miles into a blizzard to get back to that land. So it, it, it has an enormous influence, and, and I think that uh, if Willa Cather were here, she would say the same thing for O Pioneer. If Mari Sandoz was here, she would say the same thing for Old Jules. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure you can really write about Nebraska or Montana or the Dakotas without developing the landscape as a principal character in whatever it is you're writing. When I was in sixth grade, which I guess means I was 11 or 12 years old, uh, we were assigned to do a biography of somebody we admired. And I wrote this single-spaced, 40-page, cursive biography of Crazy Horse, whom I was thoroughly, totally obsessed with. Almost, uh, it could have been a, a, a clinical psychosis of uh, some kind, but I was, as some people uh, are enamored of Mickey Mantle or Jesus, uh, uh, Crazy Horse was, was, was uh, this overwhelming passion. He was my Moby Dick. And uh, I just sat down and wrote out a 40-page, uh, I think the assignment was for like four pages or five pages, and uh, I wrote out a 40-page biography of Crazy Horse in sixth grade, and uh, I, I can remember just the buzz of doing that and how satisfying and fulfilling it was and how uh, um, it was almost magical that you could... Uh, uh, form these sentences and these paragraphs uh, that were devoted to trying to get the reader to understand uh, all of the different aspects of, of his personality as I, as I interpreted them. The perseverance, the courage, uh, the fight for freedom in his homeland and his people. And it was a, a, a very powerful feeling that uh, I'd never had before. And um, it set in motion a lot of things that uh, I've tried to hold on to since. Well, I have specific themes, I think, that, uh, that really uh, act as, as uh, depth charges going off. And, and those themes that I look for, you know, my inspiration is a good story. Uh, there's nothing that's more inspiring than just a good story. I, I collect stories like some people collect model cars or, or model airplanes or butterflies or whatever. I love good stories, and I'm always on the lookout for good stories. And uh, whether they be newspaper stories or magazine stories or something that you can develop into a book-length story. Uh, and often those stories have, have um, uh, something uh, of the, the triumphant spirit of, um, uh, of the human condition, uh, for lack of a better word. It's somebody who... Uh, really should not have succeeded. It's somebody who should have just called it quits. It's somebody who should have just cashed it in and said, no, I can't overcome this. The deck is stacked too much against me. But somehow, whether as an individual or as a tribe or as a group of people, they were able to persevere and endure and, and, and adapt and adapt and survive uh, when no one expected to. And often there's there's almost an element of redemption in the mix. And uh, if, if a story has just some combination of those elements, uh, there's a good chance that uh, I'll get very interested in it, whether, I, whether as a reader or as a writer. I'm not one of these people who, and I know people like this, we all do, I'm not one of these people who, who, who rises with the sun and is at their work desk at uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning and then writes for three or four hours and then uh, calls it a day. I, I like, when I'm, when I'm really in a rhythm, uh, a book rhythm, I, uh, I like to be at the writing desk uh, at around, right around 9 o'clock in the morning and then I can write straight through. I can write for for enormously long stretches uh, and I will frequently write almost straight through from nine until four mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, take a break, uh, get some exercise and then maybe spend another couple hours between eight and ten uh, fiddling with whatever it is. So it's not unusual to write seven or eight hours or even nine hours uh, for me. I, I prefer it that way. That, that depends to some degree on what it is I'm writing. Sometimes uh, if it's an essay uh, for a newspaper, for example, uh, I might r have a wild writing style, a, 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 a flashy writing style, a style that uses a lot of hyperbole or a lot of adjectives or even some cases it may be uh, 
hyperventilated prose. Uh, but if I'm really writing uh, something book length and I'm really serious about it, it's just the opposite of that. What I, what I would say my, my comfort zone, zone is, is, is something that it's a very quiet voice and it's a very understated voice. If the story is powerful enough, I want to get out of the way of the story and let the story come to the reader. Hemingway once said, and uh, I, I am a true disciple of at least this one thing that he said, and, and that is, it was, it was revolving, involving understatement, how powerful understatement is. And his basic phrase was, uh, the, the, the lower the flame, the greater the explosion. And there is an enormous amount of truth in that. And uh, I would say, if it's something I'm serious about, a book length project, that that is my voice. It's very understated. Um, and, and I let the power of the story resonate by understating it rather than overstating it because you will kill the power of the story the second you try and uh, uh, overstate it. The first audience I always write for is myself. Uh, I, am, I am the first audience that I write for, and if, uh, if I'm not happy with a phrase, a, a, a paragraph, a page, uh, and, and I don't please this audience, then I go back and I go back and I go back until I am satisfied. Once that has been taken care of, what I'm really writing for is a general audience. Uh, I, want, I, I, I want the bus driver uh, with a ninth grade education to find my stories as accessible as a PhD in history. Uh, and, and I don't want either of them bored. I want the PhD in history to be able to, to read Standing Bear uh, and, and, and learn a good deal, even though he may have uh, already trafficked in that same uh, intersection. But I want him to come out of the book learning things that he didn't know before. I want the ninth grade uh, dropout bus driver to be able to move through the story, to be able to uh, absorb the narrative thread and, uh, and, and absorb the information uh, and learn uh, a good deal too without feeling that he's being, uh, that, 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 that the writing is over his head or it's pretentious or it has the stink of academia on it. Uh, I don't want any of that in my writing. I want it very accessible, but I don't want it to be, uh, you know, uh, I don't want it to, uh, to be pretentious or um, uh, uh, overblown, uh, but being, being uh, available to a very wide general audience. First of all, grow a very thick skin. Uh, grow a very thick skin. Uh, it's uh, it's, it's Dar Darwinism at its extreme. And if you can't deal with rejection, then you have no business ever entertaining. Do something safe. Become a CPA. Uh, you know, do, do claims adjusting for Allstate, uh, where you know at 10 o'clock every morning that you're not going to be rejected. Um, do something safe. Uh, if you want to be a writer, uh, you have to be passionate. Uh, you have to be able to uh, accept rejection. You know, they say that necessity is the mother of invention. Maybe for writers, rejection is the mother of invention because you will keep trying different things and you will stay with it and stay with it until you finally, uh, after the 29th knock on the door, that door is going to crack open and somebody will say, I'm kind of interested in this poem or this short story or this manuscript. Uh, but that 29th door won't open unless you have the thickness to endure the 28 that uh, were, were bolted shut on you. Uh, find something you're absolutely passionate about because uh, book writing is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And uh, if, you're, if you're not willing uh, in, in the sixth month to, to still be excited about coming up to your writing desk each day, then, then, then head on off to State Farm. You know, what I love about being back in, in, in this part of the country is there are so many good stories here. There is so much low-hanging fruit in the, in the literary orchards of the northern Great Plains. It's not like Miami and New York, particularly New York. If you think uh, you wake up, you're in the shower, man, this would be a really good story. This would be a really good magazine article. This would be a really good book. And you get out on the streets later that day and you turn around and you realize that there are 12,000 people lined up behind you with almost exactly the same idea or a very similar idea. Here, there's this uh, fruit that says uh, Standing Bear. Oh my God, uh, what a magnificent story. You look around, 
and you can see all the way to the Colorado border. There's nobody there. There's nobody clamoring after that store. You've got it all to yourself. So I love this feeling of being here and, and really almost uh, being the, the proverbial kid in the candy jar. There are so many good stories here, uh, and there's really no competition for them because uh, people... Uh, I, I, there, there, there are segments of East Coast society that, that really uh, believe that people between Chicago and Denver uh, can't read. They haven't learned how to read yet. Uh, and uh, that's fine, you know, because that just means uh, we can keep walking through the literary orchards uh, in, the, in, the, in the northern plains and just keep plucking this nice, ripe, juicy fruit and not have to worry about uh, anybody else competing for it. So uh, what's an example of that? Well, one thing I'm very interested in pursuing next uh, in a book project is, is the story of, of Dr. Susan LaFleche Peacock. Um, come on, I mean, this is a woman who was born in an animal hide teepee on the northern Great Plains in the 1860s, and uh, 24 years later she graduates number one in her medical class uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, the first native uh, female doctor in the United States competing against all of these Brahmins from these families, uh, wealthy East Coast families who grew up with servants and manicured uh, gardens and, and the, the girl from Nebraska who grew up in a buffalo hide teepee, she's number one in the medical school class and she passes up uh, what would have been a, a comfortable, lucrative career on the East Coast. She comes back to her people on the Omaha Reservation and she devotes the rest of her life to taking care of them. She hangs out a, a yellow lantern uh, on her home on a hill, um, the home of which is still beautifully preserved in Walt Hill. And this yellow lantern acted as a beacon. So in, in bad weather, in blizzards, um, in, in, in rainstorms, on dark nights, they would still be able to find their way to her door. It's a magnificent story, wonderful story, cut from the same cloth of what we were talking about earlier. And uh, um, I looked around uh, a couple of months ago and Again, I saw all the way, uh, at least to McCook, uh, there was nobody there uh, after that story, and it's just a great story. Today, I am going to talk about why I love uh, the story of Standing Bear, how it works for me on four very different levels and how I would like readers to know about those four different levels. And uh, I will air those out in, in a fair amount of detail. And then uh, I'd like to just uh, segue from that uh, into uh, a reading from the climactic chapter of the book, which is uh, chapter six. And it's uh, entitled The Color of Blood. And it's the story building towards this dramatic um, courtroom trial on, on, on the federal courthouse on the corner of 15th and Dodge Streets in Omaha, Nebraska in May of 1879. Uh, so I will read um, probably 10 or 15 minutes from, uh, from chapter 6 after I talk about uh, why I think this is uh, such a phenomenal story and how I think it works uh, very well on, on four very different levels. <music> My name is Meredith McGowan and I am the curator of the Heritage Room. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room and to the John H. Ames Reading Series. Uh, we're excited that this reading series has been in existence for about 25 years. Um, we recently had changes in the hours at Bennett Martin. We used to always be on Thursday evenings and now we have changed to Sunday afternoons at 2 o'clock. So good that you're here today. Thanks for coming. And by the way, this is the 182nd reading that you're here to listen to. We are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors, and it is a special collection that, de that is dedicated to preserving and promoting works by and about Nebraska authors. It's a representative collection, of course, because we don't have lots and lots of space, but about 13 volumes and about 3,000 authors are represented in the room here. And we also do, if you look around the room, uh, we do have artwork that reflects authors as well. And we have information files about authors that we can pull out anytime you're looking for 
some information. Um, and other memorabilia too, magazines, pictures, manuscripts, and those kinds of things too. So uh, we'd love to have you come back during our regular public service hours. And actually we're open right now on Sunday afternoons from two to five. Um, we're just doing the program right in the middle of our public service hours. But we're also open on Tuesday through Friday from 12 to three. So that would be another opportunity for you to come in and look around if you'd like. Um, and for those of you who might be just watching this on TV, this room is on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library, uh, 14th and N downtown in Lincoln. So just thought I'd mention that. We'd also like to uh, thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. We're able to bring, bring programs like this to you because of an endowment that was established through their volunteer efforts. Um, I guess it is worth noting too that the the Heritage Room is not tax supported. It's, uh, it is run through that endowment that the NLHA established some years ago. Um, and they do make money through memberships for their group and also from a spelling bee, an adult spelling bee that we just held last Tuesday. So I can't even tell you to come to it next week, but um, it's kind of a fun event. So you might watch for that next year. It's always the second Tuesday of April. Um, and you can look up Nebraska Literary Heritage Association on the web if you'd like to find out more information about the group, and we do have some information here too. So our reader today is Joe Starita. I believe he's currently an associate professor at UNL's College of Journalism and Mass Communications. He did grow up in Lincoln. He left and he returned in 1992. He has two degrees from UNL. If I looked correctly, a BS in journalism that he received in 1978 and an MA that he received in 1995. And in between those two degrees, I think he spent some time doing quite a bit of investigative journalism, investigative reporting for the Miami Herald. And I believe he was in New York part of that time as well. In 1995, his book, The Dull Knives of Pine Ridge, a Lakota Odyssey was published by Putnam. He's twice been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize, and just this year, St. Martin's Press published his second book, I Am a Man, Chief Standing Bear's Journey for Justice. And I suspect we'll hear more about that today. We're happy to have Joe here with us. Please help me welcome him. I want to thank all of you for, for giving up a chunk of your Sunday afternoon. It looks like a pretty nice day out there to, uh, to come here to the Geske Room and to, uh, and to hear me talk. Uh, I want to keep this uh, very, very informal. And the basic game plan that I see unfolding uh, is uh, I want to talk about uh, this book that just came out two months ago on Chief Standing Bear, I Am a Man, Chief Standing Bear's Journey for Justice. I want to tell you um, why I like this book. Uh, I want to speak for probably a half an hour uh, on the, the, the four different levels that this book, this story really engaged me and obsessed me actually and still does to some degree. And I, and I think it's, uh, it's four very distinct levels and each one of those kind of uh, got some traction and, and kept pulling me along and pulling me along and I, I'm kind of fascinated by those four levels. So I'm going to talk about that and then I'm going to do a reading probably about a 10 minute reading from chapter six in the book that's called The Color of Blood. It's the climactic chapter. It's the courtroom scene on uh, 15th and Dodge, uh, federal courthouse in Omaha, May of uh, 1879. And then I would also like to um, open it up to any questions you might have. So uh, we're going to talk uh, very informally. I'm going to set aside some time uh, for you to an ask and, and uh, engage in any kind of questions. And, um, and then we'll, um, we'll go from there. But first, uh, I'd like to tell you about uh, why this story has kept me awake uh, many nights, uh, just thinking about it and, and being excited about it, and some days getting up at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning uh, because I couldn't sleep because I was so wound up. Um, some people would call that a sickness, perhaps, and maybe it is, but I don't care. Uh, okay. Uh, this book uh, I, I, I really love for uh, four different reasons on four different levels. And, and the most basic one is a very simple one. I love this story. This is a magnificent story. It's got everything you could ever want as a reader or as a writer. Uh, 
you would think uh, if you really kind of look at the themes and how this story unfolds and you look at the arc of this story, uh, this is the stuff uh, that you find in Homer or the stuff you find in Virgil or the stuff you find in Shakespeare. But no, we found it right here, right here on the banks of the Niobrara River, no more than 200 miles from where we're standing right now, this magnificent uh, sweetheart of a story that's got all of the universal themes in it. A group of people who were trying very hard to turn uh, from their ancient way of life, their traditional way of life, to the new world order that Standing Bear and his 700 Ponca near the confluence of where the Niobrara and the Missouri are, uh, they understood that a new world order, that there were new rules, and they were trying very hard to adapt to this, and they were succeeding. Uh, they had a fertile valley that was blossoming with, 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 with wheat and corn and, 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 and squash and pumpkins and uh, a river that was loaded with uh, trout and uh, all the things they needed to sustain them. And then one day out of the blue, a stranger from New York City, the east side of Manhattan, shows up in their village, January of 1877, and he says out of the blue, the Great Father wants you to move to Oklahoma. Oklahoma? There was no word for that in the Ponca. That was as abstract. He might as well have said uh, the Great Father would like you to pull up roots in the Niagara Valley and start growing corn on Mars. Um, there was no concept of Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, uh, the architects of the settlement of the West had deemed Oklahoma, then called Indian Country, as this giant clearinghouse where all the tribes were going to be swept from the plains and deposited in Oklahoma. Uh, so the Ponca are living very comfortably and very well and uh, thriving in some ways. Uh, and, and, and a man pops up in their in their camp and says, no, you have to move to Oklahoma. They, they, they had no word for that. They had no concept. It was totally abstract. Standing Bear said, no, I won't go. His brother, Big Snake, the enforcer, in the camp said, no, I won't go. So they slapped ankle irons on them, they, they loaded them in a wagon, they, they, they drove them up to Missouri to Fort Randall where they put them in prison. And while Standing Bear and Big Snake were in prison, the cavalry came down from Fort Randall and they began to forcibly order the Ponca people to start packing up and bringing their goods. Uh, eventually Standing Bear and Big Snake were, were released from prison and on a very cold, rainy, gloomy uh, May uh, morning in 1877, uh, they were uh, fording across a very swollen uh, Niobrara River and thus began what the Ponca called the, the, the Trail of Tears. Um, and, and, and the next 65 days when they're being forcibly marched with bay bayonets to their back, uh, they, they, they were enduring things that were almost biblical, these, these, these snowstorms deluges, uh, and finally searing heat, uh, tornadoes. Uh, May 19th, three days after they began, a little baby girl, white buffalo calf girl, uh, just after they had crossed the Elkhorn near Neely, she dies. She's the first of, of many to die on this trip, three days into it. And her mother is so crushed and so heartbroken that she cannot go to the graveside funeral. The father begged the townspeople of Neely, Nebraska, he begged them to treat this six-month-old baby girl as though uh, this Ponca baby was one of their own and to take care of her because the bayonets were still at their back and they had another 500 miles to go to get to this Oklahoma. Uh, one of the carpenters in Neely made a cross for White Buffalo Calf Girl and the, the leading citizens of Neely promised um, white Buffalo Girl's father, that they would treat her as one of their own. And for the last 132 years, uh, White Buffalo Calf Girl's grave is the only one that's allowed to have flowers on it all year round at Laurel Hill Cemetery in Neely, Nebraska. And um, on Mother's Day, mothers from all over the northeastern Nebraska area will bring their daughters to this grave and tell them the story about how the Ponca were forcibly removed from their land and how this baby girl three days into the journey had died of pneumonia. This is not a good story. There's nothing to work with here. They keep going, they keep going. They get to Oklahoma. One third of the tribe dies in the first year. These are northern people. They're not accustomed to the heat and humidity they find on these dank river bottoms. No preparations have been made. No homes have been built. 
no uh, uh, sturdy canvas tents have been aside. They were basically dumped on uh, the reservation lands of the Quapaw, and these northern people who were acclimated to a colder climate had no way of enduring what they found in these dank, uh, humid, 100-degree-plus uh, river bottoms in Oklahoma in July of 1877, and within one year, uh, these mosquitoes the size of Volvos that overwhelmed their camps had taken out a third of the tribe. On Christmas week of 1878, Standing Bear's only son, a 16-year-old boy named Bear Shield, is dying of malaria uh, in this cheap, uh, tattered army canvas tent uh, along a frozen creek bottom of Oklahoma. And before his eyes close in death, he extracts a promise from his father, the chief, Standing Bear, that upon his death, his father will gather his remains and he will take his body back to the Niobrara River homeland. Um, Bear Shield dies, and on January 2nd, 1879, Standing Bear puts the body of his only son, a son he had invested years and years and years of work in because he knew Bear Shield was going to be the bridge that would take the Ponca from the old ways to the new ways. Bear Shield knew how to speak English. Bear Shield went to live with an Episcopal missionary on the Santee Reservation. All of this because the father, the chief, Standing Bear, knew that his days were over and the new way could only be taught by someone much younger. If the Ponca were to have any chance to survive in this new world order, they had to adapt. He was too old to do this, but he knew that Bear Shield wasn't. And so he had spent lots of time grooming him, preparing him. Now he loaded his body into the back of a rickety buckboard on January 2nd, 1879, into a fierce blizzard. They began walking essentially from Oklahoma to, to South Dakota, South Dakota border. Up on the road ahead that day, it was 27 below zero. And they had to put the old people and the young people and... Uh, uh, everybody else burrowing inside of haystacks and open fields in order for them to survive. Um, this is a good story. <laughs> this is a good story. You can get excited about a story like this. And they keep going and they keep going in the dead of winter, walking, walking, walking. Eight of these uh, 29 people with standing bear are children. And they get within two days of the old homeland and they are spotted and they are arrested and they are forcibly marched to Fort Omaha where the commandant of the fort is the most veteran Indian fighter in the United States Army, a brigadier general by the name of George Crook, a man who had spent, except for four years in the Civil War, his entire adult life fighting American Indians. And now the orders were from his commander, General Philip Sheridan in Chicago, to take these bedraggled Ponca who were starving whose flesh had been blackened by frostbite and was hanging off of their bones, uh, to turn their faces south, put the bayonet to their backs, and get them back to Oklahoma, because he did not want them to set an example of the other tribes that were being warehoused in Oklahoma, that, hey, if you didn't like it here, if your people were dying, if you were starving, you just simply could get up and walk back home. He didn't want any precedent being set, so Crook's orders were to turn around and march those Ponca back to the Indian Territory. George Crook is this magnificent character. He's one of the pivotal characters of the book. You couldn't make these people up. You couldn't, if you were on the most powerful hallucinogenic drug that man had ever known, uh, and I haven't been there, but I'm just saying, if, you, if one had, you couldn't make up these characters. You couldn't make up General George Crook. And he has been dueling late at night for several years now between his military conscience and his social conscience. And one had not quite gotten the upper hand, but on this particular occasion, when he gets the word from General Sheridan to turn these Ponca's faces south, march them back to whence they came, because we're not going to set a precedent, we're not going to open any Pandora's box here, Crook could not deal with that. Crook could not deal with that. So what he did instead was he saddled up his horse. He got on it after midnight in the cover of darkness and he rides three miles south and he knocks on the door of a reporter for what would become the Omaha uh, World Herald and he says Mr. Tibbles I think I have a story you might be interested in. Now I've been in journalism for 30 years and I can assure you 
this is not the way it normally works. I have not in my lifetime encountered any high-ranking military officer who has ever come to me with a good story that would really embarrass the United States military, nor do I know of any other reporter uh, who has had the equivalent knock on the door that General Cook provided on, uh, on, on that night. Um, this is a fine story. It's got great characters. It's got this, this taut narrative thread. It has um, a man who somehow found the wherewithal to keep walking and to keep walking, whether it was 27 below, whether it was 102, whether he was on the open Kansas prairie burrowing into a haystack, or whether now he finds himself on the grounds of Fort Omaha uh, with orders that he had already, that, that Standing Bear had already uh, found out about, which meant his people would essentially die. They would never make it back uh, to Oklahoma. But General Cook decides that his social conscience now has, um, now has uh, uh, the upper hand over his military conscience, and he, he does what he thinks is right. For, the, for, for, for maybe the first time uh, in this duel, uh, he, he decides he can't, he, can't, he can't just simply blindly follow this order. He can't do it. He has come to respect the Indian people that he is in charge of basically wiping out. And the more time he spends with them and the more time he spends with the chiefs, the better he gets to know them and understand and the more he begins to like them. And so he is at constant war with uh, the orders that he's given and with how he sees uh, these people, which is totally different than when he graduated from West Point 30 years earlier and went west to fight his first Indian battles. So he becomes this great character. Uh, so I love this book for, for, for one very basic reason, and that is because of just what a magnificent story it is and how powerful these characters are and how complex these characters are, uh, which brings us to a second level. Uh, and you can look at the entire sweep of the 19th century, and I defy anybody really to find a century that, by the way, began... Uh, with these devastating smallpox epidemics that came very close to completely annihilating entire tribes. I think the Mandan were down to 12 or 14 people left. They had no resistance against these diseases that were brought by white trappers and fur traders. Uh, that's how the century began. The century ended, as you recall, on a frozen battlefield at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. Now somewhere between those epidemics that opened the 19th century and Wounded Knee, which kind of closed out the century, I don't believe you can find another instance in which this many levels of white society came to the aid of an American Indian. And this happened time after time after time with Standing Bear. And it's kind of startling, because if you look at the different levels of society that came to this man, it basically it was every level of society that existed. His friends, his neighboring ranchers and farmers in Niobrara were appalled at the orders to send him and his people back uh, to, to, uh, to, to the Indian Territory of Oklahoma. They were appalled in 1877, two years earlier, when they were driven out, forcibly removed from the land, because they were good neighbors. And when the white ranchers were starving, and the Ponca's fertile valley homeland was awash in uh, excess corn, excess wheat, and excess soy, they gave them to the white neighbors and ranchers so the white, the white people wouldn't starve. The white editor of the Niobrara Pioneer is appalled and disgusted and outraged, so he starts pounding editorial after editorial, uh, railing against this decision to send these good people, Indian people, to this hated hellhole that... Uh, uh, that was killing off these Indian tribes. Uh, they were they were dropping like flies. Um, you start seeing the preachers, the preachers in Omaha were appalled once they got the word because Thomas Tibbles, when he got this knock midnight knock on the door from Crook, he went to see interview Standing Bear through an interpreter the next day and got the story. And he ran from the fort back to Omaha and he started going to these churches in Omaha. He went to the, uh, the, the Episcopal churches, he went to the Methodist churches, he went to the Catholic churches, and he began to engage the sympathy of the religious community in Omaha who were justifiably outraged by what an unchristian thing this was to do. And so they began to come to Standing Bear's aid. 
Thomas Tibbles goes back after visiting the churches and he starts pounding out editorial after editorial. And those editorials sweep across the Missouri and pretty soon they're appearing in the papers of the Chicago Tribune and the Boston Daily Advertiser and the New York Daily News and the New York Times, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Washington. And pretty soon you have a citizenry who are disgusted, particularly on the East Coast where there was this bottled up energy looking for a cause. The same people who had engaged in the abolitionist fervor and had kind of won that battle. They were looking for a new cause and they pick up their daily newspaper and they read about this peaceful group of Indians who were minding their own business who had never in the history of the tribe killed a white person uh, who basically were being slaughtered uh, in this place called the Indian Territory. And they began to contact their senators and demanding that some kind of inquiry be done on behalf of Standing Bear and the Ponca. And before long, that's exactly what happens. The United States Senators begin to investigate. Um, the Bishop of Omaha, Bishop Clarkson, and that's a name that almost anybody in Omaha knows, Bishop Clarkson was was a friend of the Secretary of the Interior, who was a spectacular character in his own right. Secretary Schertz, so Bishop Clarkson in Omaha, he begins to send telegram after telegram and letter after level to the Secretary of the Interior saying, come on, uh, you've got to be kidding me. You can't send these people back to Oklahoma. That's a death sentence. Have you no Christian sensibilities? So I have never seen a story particularly in the 19th century, in which white ranchers, white farmers, bishops, clergymen, parishioners, United States senators, congressmen, all rallied around one American Indian in his cause, anywhere close to the extent that it happened in this particular case. It's kind of astonishing. The Jewish community in Omaha begins taking up a collection once they find out that Standing Bear has gained access to a federal courtroom, the Jewish community in Omaha begins taking up a, de a collection for his defense fund. So, show me another case where Jewish citizens are asking white Christian um, communities for money to help pay for an American Indian's defense. In 18th, are you kidding me? Find me an equivalent of that story. It doesn't exist. So this is another reason that you can really get engaged in this story. It's unique. It just has this interesting response of the white community at so many different levels. And I guarantee you that just wasn't happening in the 19th century. A very different response was usually the case. Another third level that I really love about just the basic arc of this story, just the fundamental facts of this story is how well the game plan that was drawn up by our founding fathers was executed in the case of Standing Bear. Uh, we all know who these people are, the Thomas Jeffersons, the Ben Franklins, the John Adams, uh, and these people who, who crafted this little document that we call the Declaration of Independence in the United States Constitution, and how Thomas Jefferson, a young man in his 30s, the principal architect of the Declaration of Independence, who knew um, some of the horrors that were going on in Europe that had gone on in Europe in this feudal system, in this serf system, in kings and queens, and how it didn't work, and how he envisioned a whole new world order, a whole new democracy, uh, something that became known as Jeffersonian democracy, was going to be tried out as a great experiment in the United States of America, and how this new government would have three different branches, and each one would kind of act as a check and balance against the other one that the legislative branch, uh, if it got too uppity, there was the executive branch to take it down a notch. And if the executive branch got too uppity, there was a judicial branch that would take it down a notch. And how these three branches of government would act as one, but they would all make sure that the other two branches didn't get um, an undue amount of power that would tilt it in a direction that would make this new fledgling country resemble something like, like Europe where the balance of power had completely gotten out of control. And Jefferson didn't want this to happen, and the people, uh, uh, the founding fathers didn't want this to happen. So they came with this form of government that was pretty interesting and pretty unique. And I can't think of an example, I can't think of an example, I'm sure there, there, there may be historians uh, in, this, in this very group who can, but I can't personally think of an example of where the blueprint 
for this new way of doing business called Jeffersonian democracy was carried out any better than it was in the case of this middle-aged American Indian chief who now found himself sitting on the third floor of a limestone building on the corner of 15th and Dodge on a fine spring day in 1879. And how this whole arc of his story, starting with his arrest two days short of the ancestral homeland where he was going to bury Bearshield, how this can be looked at as any better example of discharging the game plan that the Founding Fathers created. Because each one of these three branches of government, if you look at this system through the prism of Standing Bear, each of these three branches of government did exactly what they were supposed to do. 2AT. The legislative branch did its job by calling for congressional investigations. Those investigations revealed that there had been a grotesque miscarriage of justice in basically stealing the Ponca's land that they had two treaties signed, ratified by the Senate, that made them the legal owners of the, of the land, kicking them off of that land at, 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 at Bayonet Point. These congressional inquiries revealed that uh, the judge, acting on behalf of the judicial branch, heard all of the evidence and concluded, this isn't right. I don't care who this man is. He has been wronged, and I am going to, I am going to address this miscarriage of justice. So the judicial system acted as it was supposed to act. The legislative system did the hearings that it was supposed to do, and, and ultimately the executive branch looked at all of the evidence and said, no, this, we're not going to let this happen. Are you kidding me? We want Standing Bear and his people to go back to the Niobrara, and we want them to have their homeland restored. And that's what happened. And the fourth branch of government, that I may be a little, uh, this may be home cooking to some extent, but you got to feel pretty proud, and uh, that's not always the case that I'm fully aware of, of what the fourth estate did in this case. The, the, and this is exactly what Thomas Jefferson had envisioned. And he had said many years earlier, given a choice between a government without newspapers or newspapers without government, I will always choose the latter. Well, that hasn't always been uh, maybe the best course of action, but in this case, I would argue that uh, those words that Jefferson once spoke were justified because Thomas Tibbles and many other courageous editors of Nebraska newspapers initially, but in the end of many newspapers, they did what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to get this information to the public. That was their job, and that's what they did. And the public took it from there. They got a hold of their congressman. They got a hold of the Secretary of the Interior, Carl Schurz. So this is just a, 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 an incredibly tight uh, example of how well this system can work. And I can't think of another example of it working any better. So I like it uh, on the level that um, it wasn't an abstract concept, this idea of checks and balances. It actually works. Now, we can argue about whether or not it's been working very well lately, uh, but maybe that's for another discussion. My argument is simply that it worked very well between 1877 and 1879. The fourth and final level that I think this story works on, and it really excites me and has for many years, is that it works to me on a metaphorical level. Now, what do I mean by a story working on a metaphorical level? Well, Standing Bear, when he was in the courtroom for two days in early May 1879, was relentlessly... Uh, question and interrogated by the young government prosecutor, Genio Lambertson, who was trying his first case in federal court. This endless stream of questions, who are you? Who are your people? Where do you come from? What do you believe in? Who is your God? What kind of system of, of, of living do you, do you and your people engage in? He was peppered with these questions day after day hour after hour in a federal courtroom in Omaha. But what really happened, unwittingly so, is that Standing Bear held up a mirror, a metaphorical mirror, to the United States, this 103-year-old fledgling world power. And he held up a mirror to this fledgling 103-year-old world power, and he asked them a lot of questions. He, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in essence, in effect, was asking 
America, who are you? And what do you believe in? And who is your God? And what is this God supposed to do? And what isn't an American? And what does it mean to be a Christian? And what kind of country do you have? And what kind of country do you want? And what about the original inhabitants of your soil? Who are they? And what role are they to have in this new world order? And those questions had never really been asked before in that concentrated fashion. And those questions were asked. They were asked literally and figuratively. And I find that a really fascinating uh, aspect and level that this story works on. That Standing Bear really kind of flipped the equation around and did something that no other American had ever done, which was forcing a country in which he was not recognized as a human being to answer some very basic questions about itself. And I think that's a very interesting level that this story works on, and it's one that I find uh, uh, a very fascinating, and, and also the answers. And that, that had never happened before. It had not happened in the 18th century. It had not happened at any point in the 19th century. And it was a very, it was a very good thing to have happened because what it did is it allowed the citizens of America to be better than they knew they were or better than they thought they were. It inspired them to do things that they hadn't done before. And they wouldn't have done had this case not come along. They wouldn't have taken to the streets and, 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 and gotten collections from the Christian community to, to use as a defense fund for an American Indian who had no legal rights in the very country that they were, that they were asking for donations. They, didn't, they wouldn't have had that opportunity. There wouldn't have been the opportunity for people on the East Coast to, to try and demand that a right, uh, that, that a wrong be righted if Standing Bear hadn't existed. There wouldn't be the opportunity for this grizzled frontier judge, Judge Elmer Dundee, who had never had any love for the Indian, who religiously went bear hunting twice a year, who had to actually be found by scouts because he was out bear hunting in the wilderness, to come back to Lincoln to hear a request for a writ of habeas corpus. And then he had the opportunity to do something that he had never done before in his life. And I'll, I'll read about that. And so I, I love the fact that this works as a story that you don't have to go to Greece or Israel or Mesopotamia or South Africa to find. You don't have to go to Shakespeare or Homer or Virgil to find these universal themes. We have them right here in the Niobrara River Valley. We have them demonstrated. Um, heroic is a word that we often misuse, but I would say in heroic fashion by, by, by a Nebraskan, who I would also argue is as courageous as any man who's ever come out of this state. Um, and he gave all of these white people for this one moment in the last quarter of the 19th century to do the right thing. And in almost all of those cases, they did do the right thing. And for this story to work on this metaphorical level uh, and to see how the reality of the Founding Father's blueprint could actually be carried out, uh, you bundle all that together, this is a nice story. And it's our story. It's our story. And I'm a little surprised that the number of Nebraskans that don't know this story. And I am going to make it my Moby Dickish uh, obligation to make sure that uh, uh, as many Nebraskans as possible know uh, about this story because it doesn't get much better than this. It doesn't get much better than this. So those are four very distinct and different areas and different levels that all knitted together and created this nexus that kept me up many nights just being obsessed with it, thinking about it, not being happy with this paragraph, getting back up, 3, 3.15, 3.30, fiddling around, because I, I felt an obligation to this man. I felt, now this, this is a man, if he, if he could walk 600 miles with the body of his son into the teeth of a blizzard in 27 below weather, I can get up at 3 o'clock and turn on the heater <laughs> and put on my robe and, and make some hot tea and get this paragraph right. Get this paragraph right. I owe it to him. I owe it to these people. <laughs>
and that was a very strong motivation. So I'm going to turn down the volume and, and, uh, and, and uh, try and shift gears a little bit and just simply uh, read uh, from a chapter in which I did get up. Uh, actually, I wrote this chapter in Italy. I was so paranoid about being distracted that I found a, a remote seaside village in the south of Italy where nobody could find me. Uh, and, and I had complete and total concentration for, for 30 days. It's about a 30-page uh, chapter, and, and I was happy to produce one good page a day, or what, what I thought was good one page, one, one good page. I'll leave that up to you. So, uh, at any rate, let me read uh, a little bit from chapter 6, uh, The Color of Blood. I'm going to skip around a little bit here because it's, uh, it's, it's like, I don't have time and you probably don't have the patience on, on a, a glorious spring day to, to listen to the whole chapter, but I, I want to skip around a little bit and I want to kind of hit the high points and I'll just give you an oral reconstruction of uh, some, of the, some of the pages that uh, we're going to be missing out on. Chapter 6, The Color of Blood. At 10 o'clock on the morning of May 1st, 1879, U.S. District Court Judge Elmer Dundee's gavel smacked against a wooden bench and the trial of Machu Naza versus George Crook was officially underway. The citizens had read about it for weeks in the local papers and heard about it in many of their churches and discussed it in various law offices around town. And so on that Thursday morning, on that Thursday morning, the large, the large courtroom on the third floor of the federal building was unusually crowded. In the back and along the sides, newsmen and curious lawyers and several judges and some of the town's leading citizens milled about, jostling each other, jockeying for a better position in the boisterous room. On the wooden benches sat some of the local ladies and some of the church faithful, including the Episcopal Bishop, Reverend Robert Clarkson, who like everyone else, was craning his neck, trying to get a better view of the front of the courtroom. Closer to the front, they could see Yellow Horse and Buffalo Chips, two of the Ponca men who had walked away from the warm country, sitting quietly in tattered, worn-out clothes. And not far from them was the young Omaha Indian poet and teacher Bright Eyes and the newsman Thomas Henry Tibbles. Near the front, they could see a young boy, the orphan grandson of Standing Bear, squirming on the lap of the chief's daughter, who was looking after him and calming him in the moments before the first witness was to be called. They could see that General Crook, who much preferred civilian dress and who liked to stalk the prairie collecting butterflies and bird eggs while padding about in worn-out moccasins, had arrived on this unusually warm spring morning in the full dress of a brigadier general. And when the crowd temporarily parted, when there was a fleeting glimpse all the way to the front of the courtroom, those clustered in the back and along the sides and on the benches could also see something that no one had ever seen before. An American Indian, dressed in traditional clothing, seated at the plaintiff's table in a United States courtroom. I'm going to skip to a part where the government prosecutor, the young district attorney, Lambertson, now gets his chance to question Standing Bear. And he had questioned him thoroughly about this and about that. But his basic case, the, the government's basic case, boiled down to the fact that they were outraged that Judge Dundee had ever granted this writ of habeas corpus. Uh, which allowed Standing Bear to challenge the government's authority to detain him and his people. And in the opinion of this young, brash, aggressive district attorney, the judge should never have allowed that to happen. The law was clearly on the government's side, and he violated the law in granting this writ of habeas corpus. So let me skip to the part where he starts to make his point and explain why the judge erred in granting this this right for Standing Bear to sue the government. Mostly, again and again, his arguments circled back to one central theme, which was the foundation of the government's case. The Indian, as far as the law was concerned, was neither a citizen nor a person. 
and so he could not bring a suit of any kind against the government of the United States. As a result, the court had grievously erred in granting Standing Bear a hearing for a writ of habeas corpus and then awarding him the legal opportunity to sue a U.S. Army general. Lambertson maintained this was a legal right available only to American citizens. And since Standing Bear was not a citizen, and the court had no right to issue the writ. Furthermore, he argued, the Ponca had never abandoned their traditional ways. They retained tribal ties and allegiance to their chief and depended on the government for their survival. So clearly, they were not entitled to the 14th Amendment protection. To support his main argument that only American citizens had ac access to U.S. courts, the district attorney relied a good deal on a decision the nation's highest court had reached 22 years earlier, a case involving a black man who had also wanted his freedom. Dred Scott, born a slave in Virginia around 1800, had bounced around as the property of several white masters, traveling from the slave states of Virginia, Alabama, and Missouri to the free state of Illinois and the free federal territory of Wisconsin. Back in St. Louis in 1843, after his master's widow hired him out to an army captain, Scott decided he wanted a different way of life. So he offered the widow $300 for his wife, for his and his wife's freedom. When she refused, he eventually asked the courts, with the help of anti-slavery lawyers, to set him free. A test case his lawyers and supporters hoped would eventually lead to the freedom of all slaves. In 1857, after a decade of appeals and court reversals, his case finally landed in the United States Supreme Court. In a 7-2 vote on March 6th, the High Court settled the matter. Anyone of African ancestry, slaves and those set free by their masters, could never become a U.S. citizen, and therefore they could not sue in federal court. Since Scott was black, he was not a citizen, and so he could not sue for his freedom or anything else in a federal court. Slaves were the private property of their owners. The majority ruled, and the court could not deprive owners of their property. To do so would violate the Fifth Amendment guarantee against the government seizing property from an owner without due process of law. So according to the court, Scott would remain a slave. The sons of his first master had been his friends since childhood, and they helped pay Scott's legal bills throughout the long court fight. Not long after the Supreme Court decision, Scott and his wife were returned to his boyhood friends, who bought them and then set them free. And about a year later, Dred Scott died of tuberculosis. Although each justice had written a separate opinion in the case, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney issued the court's majority opinion. A loyal advocate of slavery, he said a Negro was not entitled to the legal rights of a U.S. citizen and cited the right to sue in federal court as an example. Furthermore, Taney concluded, Negroes had, quote, no rights which any white man was bound to respect, end quote. So in the spring of 1879, on the third floor of the federal courthouse, District Attorney Lambertson did not want the present court to forget its past. In this case, he said in his concluding remarks, Judge Taney's decision remained the guiding legal principle upon which a decision must now be based. So if a Negro did not have access to a federal court, he told Judge Dundee, then surely an Indian didn't either. When the district attorney finished at 6 o'clock, the judge ordered a dinner recess. The last summer, he said, would begin in an hour. All along, the dean of the state's legal community had been scheduled to have the final say. And so on the warm early May evening after the dinner break, he made his way to the front of the courtroom. For the next three hours, Andrew Jackson Poppleton, fused history and philosophy, religion and politics, humanity, literature, and the law, isolating each of the district attorney's arguments with a focused rebuttal. And he just goes down, down the list, and after uh, about two and a half hours, uh, closer to three hours, uh, Poppleton began to wind down after he had confronted each of the government's arguments. After doing so, he slowly began to drive a legal wedge 
between the slave of yesterday and the Indian who now sat before them. Dred Scott, he said, was strictly a citizenship issue. The only question that case resolved was that since Scott was not a citizen of Missouri, he could not sue in federal court. It had also confirmed, the lawyer noted, that a slave at that time in American history had no civil rights. But in his haste to justify slavery, Justice Taney had strayed far from the legal question at hand. And so now, 22 years later, his ruling was out of date. In the spring of 1879, there were no slaves. The 14th Amendment had seen to that. Hence, this case now before the court was not specifically about citizenship at all. It was simply about who had a legal right to a writ of habeas corpus, a straightforward request compelling the government to justify why it had arrested and detained the prisoners. And the law on this particular point, Poppleton told the judge, was quite clear. It said nothing whatsoever about being a citizen. It said only that any person or party had the legal right to apply for a writ of habeas corpus. So now there was really but one question and one question only before the court. Was Standing Bear a person? To deny his legal right to the writ, Poppleton said, the court would have to conclude that he and the other Ponca prisoners were not people. They were not human beings. And who will undertake that, Poppleton asked. Why, I think the most touching thing I have heard in courts of justice or anywhere else for years was the story this old man told on the stand yesterday of the son who had gone with him to the Indian Territory, whose education he had cared for, for whom he had nurtured through the years of boyhood and sent to school in the belief that that boy would be a link between him and the civilization to which he aspired, that he would protect him from the wiles of agents, that there would be one person on the wide earth, the issue of his own loins, who would stand between him and the whites, whom he knew from experience were trying to overreach him. He said to that boy, as his eyes were closing in death in a foreign country, that he would take his bones to his old home on the running water and bury him there where he was born. The lawyer paused and turned, glancing at Standing Bear. That man, not a human being? Who of us all would have done what he did? Look around this city and look around this state, and if you can, find the man who has gathered up the ashes of his dead, wandered for 60 days through a strange country without guide or compass, aided by the sun and stars only, that the bones of that kindred may be buried in the land of their birth. No, it is a libel upon religion. It is a libel upon missionaries who sacrifice so much and risk their lives in order to take to these Indians that gospel which Christ pro proclaimed to all the wide earth to now say that these people are not human beings. It was well after 9 o'clock, almost 12 hours since the day's session began. The three lawyers had spoken for more than nine hours and the large crowd of prominent citizens of clergy and church faithful, judges and lawyers and newsmen, the general's large staff decked in military uniforms and their wives, milled about after Poppleton finished his closing arguments, all of them heading for the door. But before the crowd began to file out, the judge made an announcement. Although the trial now had officially ended and the legal proceedings were finished, one last speaker, he said, had asked permission to address the court. He supposed it was the first time in the nation's history such a request had been made, but he had decided to grant it, and he had earlier informed all the lawyers of his intention to do so. So the crowd settled back down and turned its attention to the front of the courtroom. They all saw him rise slowly from his seat, and they could see the eagle feather and the braided hair wrapped in otter fur, the bold blue shirt trimmed in red cloth, the blue flannel leggings and deerskin moccasins, the red and blue blanket, the Thomas Jefferson medallion, the necklace of bear claws. When he got to the front, he stopped and faced the audience and extended his right hand, holding it still for a long time. After a while, he turned to the bench and began to speak in a low voice. His words conveyed to the judge and the large crowd by the Omaha Indian poet, Bright Eyes. That hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, 
I shall feel pain. If you pierce your hand, you also feel pain. The blood that will flow from mine will be of the same color as yours. I am a man. The same God made us both. Then Standing Bear turned and faced the audience, pausing for a moment, staring in silence out a courtroom window, describing after a time what it was that he saw when he looked outside that window. I seem to stand on the bank of a river. My wife and little girl are beside me. In front, the river is wide and impassable. He sees there are steep cliffs all around, the waters rapidly rising. In desperation, he scans the cliffs and finally spots a steep, rocky path to safety. I turn to my wife and child with a shout, We are saved! We are saved! We will return to the swift running water that pours down between the green islands. There are the graves of my fathers. So they hurriedly climb the path, getting closer and closer to safety, the waters rushing in behind them. But a man bars the passage. If he says that I cannot pass, then I cannot. The long struggle will have been in vain. My wife and child and I must return and sink beneath the flood. We are weak and faint and sick. I cannot fight any longer. Standing Bear stopped and turned, facing the judge, speaking softly. You are that man. In the crowded courtroom, no one spoke or moved for several moments. After a while, a few women could be heard crying in the back, and some of the people up closer could see that the frontier judge had temporarily lost his composure, and that the general, too, was leaning forward on the table, his hands covering his face. Soon, some people began to clap, and a number of others started cheering. And then the general got up from his chair and went over and shook Standing Bear's hand, and before long, a number of others did the same. The bailiff asked for order, and when it finally grew quiet again, the judge said he would take the case under advisement and issue his decision in a few days. Then he adjourned the court shortly after 10 o'clock on a warm spring evening on the 2nd of May, 1879. So that's, um, that's a, a slice of, um, of chapter 6, and uh, as I say, the, the whole arc of the story really builds up to that point, and um, the judge, in fact, does release his opinion uh, in about 15 days later, and he declares for the first time in the nation's history that this... Uh, sounds fanciful uh, in 2009, but for the first time in the nation's history, he declares that uh, an American Indian is a person under the laws of the United States. And he rules in Standing Bear's favor, and he decrees um, that Standing Bear and his people be freed, and they be allowed to, uh, uh, to continue on their way. Um, so it's, it's, it's a story that has a lot of special little treats in it, I think. Uh, it has a lot of sadness, but it has a, a lot of uh, um, redemption. Um, and again, those are some of the things that make it a really fine story. And I, I, you know, obviously I'm biased, but my final thought on this matter, at least um, uh, for today, uh, is that... Um, If you look at the, the large table of American history, and, and sure, you need to have a spot there for, for the, the, the kite flyer from Philadelphia and the gangly rail splitter from Illinois and uh, the African American who wrote uh, this wondrous uh, letter from, a, from a, a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama. But I think that that table is big enough and rich enough that it would not hurt anything if somewhere at that table there was a nameplate that said Standing Bear. I think we could, uh, I think we could live with that. So, I thank you very much. Uh, you've been a very uh, fine audience, and I appreciate you taking time out from your busy day and. Uh